Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tom Campbell. I'm the director of the, of the Fine Art Museums, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon. I've got the distinct honor of welcoming you to the Young Museum for the opening day celebration of the award-winning exhibition, Alice Neal, People Come First. We're proud to be the West Coast uh, location of this award-winning exhibition that highlights Neil as one of the 20th century's most radical painters. Her advocacy for social justice and long-standing commitment to humanist principles both inspired her life and her art. And those principles, I think, have never seemed more important in the shadow of what's going on in Europe, in, in Ukraine at the moment. Today's opening celebration marks the first of a series of upcoming programs that gives us an understanding of Neil's life as a female painter, a working mother, and a lover of people. Before I introduce today's participants of the program, I want to acknowledge the co-representing institutions of the exhibition, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in association with the Guggenheim Museum Bilbao. And I also want to thank Gucci for generously sponsoring today's free admission to the exhibition. In this afternoon's panel, you will, hear, you will hear from the Metropolitan Museum of Art exhibition co-curators, Kelly Baum, the Cynthia Hazen Polsky and Leon Polsky, curator of contemporary art, and Randall Griffey, the curator of modern art, modern and contemporary art. Kelly and Randy, it's great to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. This conversation will be facilitated by Lauren Palmer, assistant curator of American art at the Fine Art Museums of San Francisco. Lauren has helped realize recent major exhibitions such as Revelations, Art from the African American South, and the San Francisco presentation of Soul of a Nation, Art in the Age of Black Power, 1963 to 83. She has contributed to a number of exhibition catalogues and scholarly publications, and she is the author of Bouquets of Art, a Floral Dictionary from the Fine Art Museums of San Francisco, of San Francisco a companion publication for Bouquets to Art, which will be released later this year. So with that, brief introduction, it's my great pleasure to introduce, to invite Lauren, Kelly and Randy to the stage. Thank you. Thank you for, thank you for being here today to join the opening celebrations for Alice Neal, People Come First. I am honored to serve as the coordinating curator for the DeYoung presentation of this remarkable and timely exhibition, a testament to Alice Neal's radical humanism and unwavering will. I am pleased to be here today with Kelly Baum and Randall Griffey of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Their sensitivity and intimate understanding of Neal's relevance shaped this remarkable retrospective, which has rightfully garnered international acclaim. With skill and compassion, Neil described the 20th century as she felt it, capturing in its many moods a personal testament. Her astonishing body of work resists easy categorization, and in her devotion to honoring and capturing the details of her world, Neil proved that she loved it all. Her sympathy spanned the spectrum of human experience. Compulsively honest, Neil's work is a lesson in seeing and feeling, knowing and listening. Her uncompromising approach recalls John Ruskin's directive to reject nothing, select nothing, scorn nothing, and rejoice always in truth. Her painterly vision, which treats our shared imperfections without sentimentality, constitutes an expression of solidarity with the world around her. By design, her, her pictures of people document urban diversity, and her paintings of such subjects as her Spanish Harlem neighbors, communist intellectuals, LGBTQ couples, and expectant mothers constitute an empathetic triumph. Neil also investigated intimacy, exploring the varying degrees of affection and attachment made visible in relationships between others. With an exacting eye and sustained consideration of her subjects, she explored how tension and anxiety are expressed through the body and subtle gesture. In the wave of Black Lives Matter and the current call for equity and racial justice, 
representational painting has again been centered for its essential role in making and mirroring American culture. With her devotion to figuration, when the fervor for abstract expressionism was at its peak, Neil plainly understood its power at a time when many others did not. Neil's dedication to painting real people, experiences, and environments insulated her from the isms of 20th century art and long resisted easy categorization by the critics and curators who too often determine the victors of art history. Her approach to figuration was one that was informed by communist political ideology, which offers an enduring critique of inequality in all its forms. With skill and compassion, Neil described the 20th century as she felt it, capturing in its many moods a personal testament. She liked thinking of a painting as a moment's monument, and her tender view of life's comedies and tragedies is especially fitting as we cautiously enter the post-COVID era. For the past two years, so many of us have felt alone together, struggling with isolation and yearning to be reunited with friends and loved ones. As you walk through the galleries today, I hope you feel invigorated by Neil's pictures of people and the evidence they offer of real human connection. Kelly and Randy, thank you for being here today to speak with me about Alice Neal and her remarkable work. Welcome. Thank you both. This is an honor, and I'm just excited to talk about Alice Neal in front of an audience. Um, <laughs> if we can just kick things off, I'll start with some slides, because we all want to be looking at art right now, even if we're not in the show. So I have some questions prepared, but if you have questions in the audience, please keep them for the end. We will have a Q&A, as time permits. But to kick things off, I have a question about style. A lot of you walking through the exhibition, you're noticing the way that her style changed and kind of morphed over time and kind of visited and encroached on other uh, artistic styles. And as the works in the exhibition demonstrate, Neil's style was entirely her own. Interestingly, she could have gone in several other directions, as evidenced by the expressionistic Robert Smithson from 1962. How would you place a work like this in dialogue with her painting of James Hunter from 1965, which signals the stylistic and formal direction she would pursue for the rest of her career? Should I <clears throat> start this one? Well, so you're looking at two very different paintings by the same artist made only two years apart. And one of, the, <clears throat> one of the really exciting things about living with an exhibition for so long is that you learn from the works on view. You learn things that you didn't realize until the exhibition opened. And I know Randy and I both wish we could publish a second catalog. And, um, and one, of those, um, one of the things we learned um, was uh, we, we identified a moment in Neil's career when she could have gone in one direction, but in fact um, went in another. And I've come to think that the painting you see on my right, um, your right, um, James Hunter, that, that this painting played a very pivotal role in the evolution of her late career. Um, now, James Hunter, um, this painting was begun in 1965. Neil was unable to finish it. Um, James Hunter had recently been drafted into the Vietnam War. She, um, she had one sitting with him, maybe two. He never returned. Uh, so she was unable to finish the painting. Now, she ended up living with this painting in her studio for many years. By 1974, she signed it and put it on the checklist for her first survey at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Now, this is a fascinating story, a, a painting that the artist was unable to finish that she eventually declared finished um, and included in an important survey. Now, it occurred to me, maybe on my 200th tour of Alice Neal at the Met, um, that, that, that things really changed, started to change for Neal after 1965. In the early 60s, she was pursuing a very brushy, expressionistic technique characterized by her um, picture of the, the great earth artist Robert Smithson. Um, but by 1970, she was beginning to paint um, pictures that looked more like James Hunter, um, pictures that were finished, but which seemed unfinished. And I imagine her living with this painting of this unfinished 
painting of James Hunter for nine years. Um, I imagine it working on her. I imagine it opening up all these avenues and possibilities for her, technical, formal. And I think that she decided that James Hunter was the future and Robert Smithson was the past. Yeah, and I'll just add on to Billy's brilliant insight there that um, that the, the, just to the, in, in case people are wondering, uh, she did sign it on the back, right? So there's no signature on the front, which there's something poignant about that too, that she's leaving the space kind of in honor of him and his memory. And um, that the, you called it so memorably during one of our hundreds of walks, <laughs> a forced experiment, yeah. right? It was a forced experiment and that the experiment as she lived with this picture opened up her mind to the expressive, metaphoric, aesthetic potential of this, what becomes a, a signature part of her style, which is this kind of unfinishedness that, for lack of a better word, really. Um, and so it's a real turning point. And um, that I just, it was, it was, uh, you're going to have the same experience, I think. I mean, uh, what, as Kelly said, that one of the great benefits of living with a show as a curator is that you you live with the works in a way, um, and you learn as that process unfolds. And this was um, one of the many things that we learned, and it's one of the other reasons that James Hunter, leaving aside going well and beyond the poignant biography of this picture, that it's it's one of her most important pictures and it's so beautifully installed as the culmination of the, at the end of your installation, so. Um, thank you both. I, I did wanna share maybe another um, observation about Robert Smithson. Because correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, but Neil painted him, at this time he was also a painter. Mm -hmm. So for her, it stylistically re represents a path not taken. But she also paints him at a time where he is on a path that he eventually rejects. Mm -hmm. That's true, and his, his style as a painter was very different than his style as an, as an earth artist. And, and actually his own paintings and drawings are quite fraught and quite expressionistic as well. And I, I, um, I think we managed to piece together how in the world Alice Neal came to know Robert Smithson in 1963. It might have been through a radical leftist bookseller. But I, I love to imagine Robert Smithson, a young Robert Smithson, fresh out of Passaic, New Jersey, <laughs> sitting in Neal's studio, in um, her new studio, actually apartment on the west side, 1963. I'm going to change the pictures above. Because this is, this is um, a question, this is my pressing, urgent question. You talk about the things that you're thinking about as you spend more time with the works. And as I'm spending more time with the works, I'm detecting more and more of this surrealist impulse. So my question is, although Neil's work is grounded in realism, her approach extends in many different directions. Uh, many different directions, touching on various realist styles, including expressionism and symbolism and surrealism. Um, so I'm particularly interested in the surrealist details that can be found scattered throughout the show. Um, for instance, there are the skull-like faces and flying dress forms in Synthesis of New York, uh, the genitalia sprouting from Christopher Lazar's head, <laughs> or the setting of Richard Gibbs, which simultaneously suggests an open field and a New York City apartment. So what do you think these instances of fantasy reflect about Neil's distinctive approach to realism? I'll start with that. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think just fundamentally imagination is always playing a part uh, in Neil's practice all throughout, I think. Uh, her nearly six decades as a as an artist, as a painter mostly. Um, I spent the four months or five months of the show's run at the Met trying to figure out what those dress forms are flying in the upper left. I was questioning if anyone here has any ideas what those things are in the upper left-hand corner. They're dress forms that have sprouted wings. I'll point them out. Uh, yeah, in the upper left-hand corner. Um, we did not figure them out, obviously. And the, yeah, the foreground is, has these, um, it's, this is one of her WPA or uh, painter paintings, which is also interesting because um, typical WPA era 
painting is more of a standard, what you call a social realist style, and this is what social surrealism, uh, which actually was a kind of thing. I mean, there were, were artists that were painting in a mode that you would call social surrealist, but um, she's always at an oblique angle to all of the dominant movements and styles of her time, and she is here as well. Um, Christopher Lazare, um, he literally has sex on his mind, um, and Neil liked to, in her um, slide lectures during the last few years of her life, um, like to you know tell stories about the sitters, and she would always call Christopher Lazare the queen of the homosexuals uh, to elicit a bit of a, a kind of uncomfortable laugh, I think, among some vis some listeners, and. Um, here, he's not only, there's not only a kind of literal metaphor of his homosexual and homoerotic desire sprouting from his head, but of course he is broken up into four different, and possibly five, it's a little clear what's in, if the foreground is also meant to be his head, maybe from behind, but that's also a kind of surreal gesture, is that his identity is scattered across the picture plane in these different guises. Um, but I can't think of any particular precedent. She was wonderfully um, evasive about her sources, and we knew we know that she loved El Greco, but El Greco doesn't help us here, right? Um, so she is, yeah, it's a particular brand of what we might call a surrealism, but I don't know that she would accept that description. Um, and with Richard Gibbs, which is just such a dynamite painting, just fundamentally, that she is blurring interior and exterior space. And um, there, I don't know, again, it's, there's no clear precedent that she seems to be mimicking. She was always her own artist. Um, my sense was, again, with regard to imagination, apparently he w mowed her lawn. So um, I, I think that might be one of the reasons the grass is following him inside. Um, is maybe he has uh, some more mowing to do, and it's it's haunting him. So Kelly, you have to. Well, and and this painting was was made in her summer home in Spring Lake, New Jersey, and I think that's also why the exterior plays such an important role in the in the painting. So Lauren, I might reframe your question in terms of abstraction, and Neil's relationship to abstraction is one that we explore openly in the exhibition, and, and you'll see this or have seen it already in the last section of the show. And for many decades, Neil declared herself an enemy of abstraction. But this was during the Cold War. Um, Neil was a communist, um, and um, you know she, um, uh, and, and, and um, during that period, very hard lines were drawn between um, capitalist democracy and communism, abstraction and representation. And so um, I, it's no surprise to me that in the 40s and 50s, she was open in her disdain for abstraction. But by the 1970s, Neil declared herself very much an ally of abstraction, and she recognized openly, she stated openly, um, that, that she needed abstraction, that abstraction was a part of her process. Um, and she says at various points that abstraction um, is what made her work modern. It's what made her work more than just traditional portraiture. And so where things don't add up in the painting of, of Richard Gibbs, I tend to think of that, um, that that's Neil taking liberties with reality. That's Neil playing with, with paint um, and, and color um, and negative and, and positive space. Thank you both. I, I mean, I'm very eager to keep looking at I, more I'm pictures. curious what your insight is there. Can you answer, well, I, address your own question? Yeah. I, well, I think what all these uh, details do is they serve as reminders of when we walk through the exhibition. It, we aren't viewing pictures of truth, we're viewing pictures of Alice Neal's truth. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind as we enjoy the exhibition. Um, uh, here we are. Um, a very dynamic group of three images depicting motherhood. Um, Neal had a complex relationship with motherhood, which she neither idealized nor sentimentalized in her work. Her unapologetic approach to this subject accentuates the psychological complexities of motherhood. Um, what are the other qualities that make Neil's topology of motherhood so distinctive? 
Well, I write about this quite a bit in my essay for the catalog. And these are, these. <laughs> we could talk for an hour about any one of these paintings. They're so layered and nuanced and, and complex. Um, and they're difficult. Um, and I think that they are difficult images of motherhood. That's part of what makes them so important. Um, as you said, they're not romanticized. They're not sentimentalized. Um, and they also span many, many decades. And my eyesight is so poor. I have to, 1930 to 1967. Um, I, I guess I'll begin with the painting in the middle, Carmen and Judy, um, from 1972, which I think is one of the most painful pictures in the show. Um, Carmen was Neil's housekeeper. Um, Carmen worked for Neil for many years when she lived on the Upper, upper West Side. Um, Carmen took care of Neil. Carmen was a kind of mother to Neil. Um, she also took care of Neil's grandchildren. So Carmen was a kind of mother to Neil's grandchildren. Carmen was a mother of her own. And you see her in this painting with um, Judy, her daughter, um, who is um, going to die soon. Um, and um, I find this painting, sorry, gosh. <laughs> it's, it's very hard to describe. I haven't really talked about it for a long time. Um, and what I, what I see in this painting, I know Laura, Lauren and I were already crying about this picture in the galleries a few days ago. Um, the baby fails to latch. The baby's in her mother's lap. She fails to latch. And the failure um, to latch is a sign of her impending death. Um, so this is a picture of motherhood that's also a deathbed scene. Um, the breast is exposed. Um, Carmen is very much exposed. Um, I think that Neil's determination to concretize the physical fact of motherhood um, and to bear witness to the loss and the trauma that so often accompanies motherhood, I think that that distinguishes her very much. Um, there's a complicated racial politics to this painting as well. Um, Neil was a white woman. Um, Carmen was um, a black woman. And sometimes I ask myself, um, should Neil have painted this picture of Carmen, you know, at her most vulnerable, um, exposed emotionally and, and physically? Um, did she take advantage of her relationship to the sitter? Um, Neil was Carmen's employer and Carmen was her employee. But then I also ask myself, what would it have meant for Neil not to have painted Carmen um, at this moment in this way? So I, I think I spent several weeks grappling with the two paragraphs <laughs> I wrote about this picture. Um, and so I, I could say a lot more about it and the other two, but I'll, I'll stop and I'm really curious to hear you and Randy. So. Um Neil has this effect on we all, all of us, right? It's, it's very powerful stuff from beginning to end. And it's worth noting in, that, in this context, too, that Neil had lost a child, right? So this is one way in which she's identifying with Carmen, but there are distinct differences between them as well, which is the dynamic you're alluding to with regard to race and class to some extent, more so race than class in this instance. But... Um, they're, they're both aware of the impending death um, and Neil, and Carmen must know that Neil had lost a daughter, an infant daughter. So they are bound in their maternal grief. Um, and in fact, the loss of Neil's first daughter, Santiana, is memorialized in the painting Futility of, of Effort from 1930. It was painted a year or two after mm -hmm. Santiana's death, but that death is in the DNA of that work. And again, I, as you said from the start, we could spend an hour on the slide, but it, it is worth noting too maybe that futility of effort, which you can see is uh, quite early, 1930, she always referred to this as her most radical work. Uh, and that will be explained, I think, in the exhibition text and if the catalog, if you pick up and have a look there. But um, Lauren, I have to, you know, if you would like to say something too on this topic, which I know is meaningful. Yeah, um, some people present might know I'm, I'm a new mother and I was working on this exhibition while I was pregnant and um, then enjoying the early days of becoming a mother. And what really strikes me, and, and we, you can invoke this in conversation with almost any work in the show, is how ahead of her time Neil was. Um, these images of infant loss, 
or the feeling of uh, approaching motherhood with fear, these are still taboo subjects. Mm -hmm. You can go to Natural Resources in the Mission, which is a great community center for expectant mothers, and you can still hear people whispering about their fears of what it's like to have a new child, or whispering about what it was like to lose a pregnancy. And the fact that Neil doesn't whisper, she, she, made, she, she painted these testaments to, to declare that these are real aspects of human experience. And um, I can't think of many artists, even now in the 21st century, who would have the, the, brave, the brave streak in their work to produce images like these. That's such a good way of putting it. Like, she does not whisper around any taboo. Yeah. She does not whisper. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, and, and there are some, I think, very much a part of this category are her pregnant nudes, which you'll see in the exhibition. And those are almost without precedent in the history of, of art. I mean, very few artists before Neil, um, during Neil's career, and um, maybe more so after. But to paint, um, to paint mothers um, and to paint the pregnant body, to paint it nude, um, that was a taboo even in the feminist movement, which I think we'll talk about in a minute. So yeah, she was, um, she was, she was really staking out new territory here. And quickly, I just have to add again that one of my, I'm just having flashbacks of the numbers of images of like on, inst on um, social media of mothers with their young children taking images of themselves in this space. I suspect you'll have the same uh, phenomenon here. And um, sometimes nursing, and nursing on a bench in front of, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's super powerful. Wow. Yeah, I can't, w I've invited many new moms <laughs> and I, I can't wait to see that. Oh gosh, we have so many things to talk about. Um, you did mention uh, her images of leaders in the feminist movement, so we can talk about those next. Um, many people are aware of these images, and some are aware of who these women were, but many may be surprised to learn that Neil harbored some uh, personal reservations about second wave feminism. And I'm curious about whether you think some of these ambivalences can be detected in these works from the exhibition. And that's a really good question. Um, and Kelly writes so wonderfully about these um, ambivalences around 70s feminism. So I, I know that she'll weigh in on that topic. Whether her ambivalences are necessarily kind of built into the paintings, I'm not quite sure. Um, probably it's one of those yes and no answers. Yes, in some instances, no in others. Um, you know, my relationship to the images that you um, have on the screen here, um, so uh, I, I, I'm drawn to aid the drawings of Adrian Rich and Mary Garrett. Um, Adrian Rich on the lower left, um, who's the towering feminist intellectual and author of the period, uh, author of many of the can canonical books from the period of woman born being one, among others, and then Mary Garrett, who was, um, is a towering feminist art historian. Um, great, um, you know, one of uh, art historians that really resuscitated uh, women artists lost in history um, and played a very important role in reshaping our field in that regard. Um, and what I was struck with these two drawings, and it, it segues into slightly adjacent issues around sexuality is that these are both images that she made on commission. So she did not approach these women as she was often want to do uh, in gaining her sitters is that these were both, and I won't go into details about that, but, um, but these were commissions. And that I think has to some extent with about her ambivalences around lesbianism. And this is where our project does, I think, add to the scholarship to some extent and the thinking around Neil um, is that Neil has so often and understandably been revered as a, a kind of saint with limitless um, tolerance, limit, limitless um, acceptance of everyone around her. And she was human. She was human. We all have limitations. We all have blind spots. 
and uh, biases that we have to work to check throughout our lives. And we um, explore these um, limits, the limits of Neil's empathy. And those limits, I think, are manifested in these images to some extent of Adrian Rich and Mary Garrett by virtue of the fact that these are commissions, um, not um, her typical practice of seeking out on her own volition. Um, and all, uh, so Cindy Nemzer um, was great, a great feminist critic, produced some uh, incredibly important criticism around Neil and, and other women artists. Um, Irene Peslicus in the, um, the painting on the, on the right, one of my favorite works in the exhibition, It's Tremendous, just, just, just the paint, the color, the composition. I was fascinated by the fact that this painting uh, was titled by Neil, Marxist Girl not feminist girl or feminist woman or Wonder Woman, or, but it was titled Marxist Girl, even though by 1972, Irene was fully embedded in the feminist movement, was acknowledged as a, as a major pioneer of the feminist movement. And so I, um, I postulated in my essay that her decision to title the painting Marxist Girl actually points to Neil's intersectional approach to feminism. Neil joined the Communist Party very early in life. She remained committed to communism her entire life. Similarly, with civil rights and um, uh, um, uh, uh, the rights of Latinx peoples. So I think here she wanted to draw attention to the imbrication of feminism and Marxism and their, 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 their necessary marriage um, uh, for, for the purposes of revolution and radical change. And it's, Kelly, the, her, kind of what we would call intersectional feminism that created the rub with 70s feminism, right? Exactly, yes, yes. There is that, and also Neil's, Neil's relationship to motherhood was, ex was, was um, extremely different from most mainstream feminists. So in the 1970s, feminists tended to think of motherhood as a problem to be solved, um, and uh, not one to be concretized, visualized, expressed. Um, I think Neil also, um, Neil was, you know, she was a, a sexual creature, and she really liked men, and and it worried her um, that there was, and she said this openly. She she worried that that feminists were anti-male, um, and she says at one point, and this is actually a brilliant quote. She says, "Aren't we all creatures in the end? Aren't we all men and women dehumanized by?" the capitalist system. And so, and this goes to her very broad interpretation of, of humanism. And yet she was embedded in the feminist movement. She was a woman's right advocate from the very beginning. So it, it with, with, as with so many other things, when it comes to Neil, it's, it's and, and or also with. Yeah. And it can't be denied that she owed her late career ascendancy to this generation of women who were championing her. Thank, thank you both. You mentioned Neil's uh, interests and in her social life, so I think that's a good segue into the intimate watercolors. Her, her social life. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, apologies for the euphemism. Um, Neil would be much more direct if she were sitting up here. Um, Neil's surviving watercolors and drawings from the 1920s and 1930s represent some of her most experimental and intimate works. By design, drawings and watercolors are executed more quickly, and these works reflect a different dimension of the artist's engagement and intimacy with her subjects. Um, how do you situate works like these and their immediacy within lar Neil's larger practice? Kelly, I just, okay. you're so good on this material, and I'll, uh, if, I have a, if I have a shred to add to what you're going to say, I, I will, but this, this is some of our favorite work. This was the big discovery, were these erotic watercolors and drawings from the um, 20s, and, 20s and, and 30s. Um, we have them from the 20s and 30s. I, I only wish that we could have included one from the Yale University Art Gallery called Joy of Life, um, which I think of as a, as a mashup of Disney and a, a kind of pornographic postcard. Um, so, so Neil made, um, Neil, what is it that I say? Um, um, it's in my essay. Neil was committed to making all kinds of revolutions for herself, um, political but also sexual. And before there was a sexual revolution, properly speaking, Neil was was making one for herself. Um, by the 1920s, um, 30s, she was 
single in New York. She had multiple partners and she gave um, voice to, she, she concretized and paint and, and line her desire for the men in her life and she embraced her sexual agency. Now we take this for granted today in 2022, although frankly we shouldn't given what's happening in the world, um, but this, is, um, this was um, prohibited in a way for a woman to make works that speak so openly to her desire and in fact this was a moment in American culture, the 30s, um, um, there are you know, uh, new rules around um, um, uh, the depiction of sexuality in films were afoot. So Neil's swimming against the tide. And in here, um, in these works, you see her in the middle with um, one lover named John Rothschild. And on the right, you see um, her lover, Jose, um, um, who she was clearly madly in love with. Um, and she usually positions herself, um, sh she positions um, Jose always as the object of a very desiring gaze. Sometimes you see her with Jose in bed. I find these incredibly tender and, and intimate. Some are very funny and irreverent, but yeah. Yeah, she's making art about her own de sexual desire in the 20s and 30s, and you just have to do, you do just have to stop and sit back and think about that and let it register. But it is interesting too that sh these are small, delicate works on paper, watercolors, um, pastels, um, that she didn't make to exhibit, right? They were private, mm -hmm. as audacious as they are, they were, she was, her, she was her own intended audience for them up until the 70s. These interestingly kind of Pun, in, pun intended, came out of the closet um, in the 70s. And it was part of her um, claiming a, an early stake in feminism before there was feminism in the 70s. So, um, you know, uh, so that, that's what I'd add to that, the, the larger context. Oh, and um, I, I know that this information is on our didactics, but reminding our our listeners and viewers and, and guests today that these are also just a few of surviving works on paper. Mm -hmm. And we were speaking earlier about, we don't know how many more incredible, revelatory, intimate drawings were lost to that fire set by Kenneth Doolittle. Um, so if this is anything to judge from, she had she must have had an incredible visual diary. And, and we're sorry. And, and Doolittle was, was a, another lover who attacked um, her, well, I forget what year, 1934? December 34. Um, in a probably opium saturated rage, set fire to the contents of her studio um, and destroyed hundreds of works probably along these lines. And you'll, you'll see in the uh, ac ac exhibition a new drawing of Doolittle as well as a photograph by Doolittle of Neil that's singed around the edges. And that's a photograph that survived the fire but which bears witness um, to, to that event, that violence. Um, I'm going to skip forward many decades now. And this is one of the most um, popular, both of these works have been incredibly popular with our visitors so far, and I think with good reason. Um, Randy, in, in your catalog essay, you note that Neil's double portrait of the performer, playwright, and poet Jackie Curtis with friend and occasional collaborator Rita Red is often misunderstood. What is frequently misinterpreted about this painting, and are there aspects of it that are made clearer when it is placed in conversation with the later Jackie Curtis as a boy? Thank you very much for that question. <laughs> oh, this is one of Jack. This is one of Alice's greatest. Um, and good on the Cleveland Museum of Art for scooping this up a few years ago at auction. Uh, I wish I would have been that curator. Um, also, just for a point of clarification, it's a little confusing. Is sometimes the sitters are identified by in the title from from right to left or left to right. So Jackie is actually on the right, Jackie Curtis in the red wig, and that's not real hair, and probably not, not a surprise, but that's, that's a wig. And then Rita Red is the stage name of the figure uh, whose birth name was Richard Solo um, on, on the left. So the part of my essay is meant to sort of um, clarify some of the relationships and the language around the relationships of Neil's, well, broadly to investigate Neil's relationship 
with her queer sitters and within that larger context uh, clarify kind of the language and the relationships of her sitters, like especially in these double portraits, which were commonly, have been commonly interpreted as um, almost like marriage portraits. It's like you're, you're like she's painting boyfriends or um, and there's a different double portrait that um, very, for me, humorously has been called domestic partners. And those guys were not domestic partners. Um, so uh, in this case, you have the wonderfully irreverent Jackie Curtis and um, another Lower East Side uh, performer, less uh, notorious than Jackie Rita. And this is such a great picture because it really indicates, it really, Neil really captures Jackie Curtis's lust for the spotlight as a performer to, to the point that, you know, Jackie is kind of moving into the center of the composition and is beginning to kind of, to push Rita Red off to the side, even though Rita looks a bit like a buttress that's holding Jackie up. And there are clips online of them performing where literally Rita is holding Jackie Curtis up. <laughs> so. Um, whether or not, of course, Neil knew all of that is another story, but they have been often regarded or assumed to have been romantic lovers, and there's no evidence at all that that was the case. What I investigate in my essay is that actually just the summer before this sitting with Neil in, this, in the fall of uh, 1970, earlier that summer they had played both um, uh, roles as actors in a film um, by an avant-garde Serbian filmmaker by the name of Dusan Makovev. Um, and it's in that film they play, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend isn't necessarily the right uh, framework because Jackie plays a trans character in that film. Um, and on that note, Neil liked to describe Jackie very transgressively as a transvestite. And that's also not how Jackie Curtis identified. So there have been multiple layers of misunderstanding and misreading, some of it well-intended. You know, there's maybe kind of a hopefulness about people wanting to think that they're a loving couple, but they, they just weren't. Um, and so I, I think that sometimes these images have been uh, used as kind of screens of projection of somebody's own uh, desire or even an agenda. So uh, Kelly, would you like to? Wait. Oh, and then we do have Jackie Curtis as a boy, which he, he would wear men's, or what we think of as young men's wear, as a kind of drag. Um, you know, before RuPaul said, you're born naked and everything else is drag, um, famously, which got, you know, was common kind of, uh, kind of a common adage in, in lit lit uh, critical theory in the 1990s in graduate school. Um, you know, Jackie Curtis's uh, performance was about gender as performance, and so all um, costume was for her, for him, a kind of drag. Um, I, I would only add that I learned from Lauren, um, from her presentation on Wednesday, that Jackie is referenced in the song Walk on the Wild Side. Do you, do you, yeah. um, Jackie thought, thought she was James Dean for a day. Mm -hmm. I read later that um, I read a reference to Jackie Curtis believing that at times he was the reincarnation of James Dean, despite the fact that he was maybe seven years old when James Dean died, um, that the, his James Dean's body, a spirit slipped into his body, uh, but it was something that he would only invoke when he felt like it. Right. Oh, another fun thing, and I, I'm going to recommend the Jackie Curtis documentary uh, which is fantastic, superstar in a house dress. And what I find really charming is Jackie's friends, uh, depending on the, on the particular anecdote, refer to Jackie as he or she, depending on the occasion and the, and the, the punch line, um, which I think really sums up how um, I'm relating to these works. I think they require each other, but mm -hmm. uh, th I think that you need Jackie Curtis as a boy in order to understand mm -hmm. Jackie and Rita. It's great to have them both. Um, well, I'm seeing the time. Is, is it time for our Q&A, or do we have time for one more question? One more? Um, okay, I think that you may have been, were you alluding to this painting, Randy? The one oh. on the right? Yes. Okay, yes. well, um, then we can talk about it. Because uh, 
As you mentioned, Neil repeatedly engaged with members of the LGBTQ community, and her in her depictions of same-sex couples, she demonstrates a kind of empathy and nuance that was not yet seen in the mainstream. What, what kinds of assumptions did Neil challenge in these works, and, and what else did you want to say about uh, Borden and Batcock? Well, this is, and you did such a wonderful job of parsing these relationships in the walkthrough that we, we had earlier in the week. Um, in the case of Jeffrey Hendricks and Brian, uh, Brian's, um, uh, Brian's last name was Busek, but it's not written into the um, title formally. And here's another case in both instances where the order of the sitter, according to the title, reads right to left, uh, kind of unusually. So Jeff Hendricks is in the green, and Brian has the plaid shirt and the hairy chest on the left. And similarly, David Borden is in the suit and tie on the right, and Gregory Badcock is in his underwear and socks <laughs> so on the left. So there, these two double portraits of gay men are very different relationships. I mean, I think that it's just fundamentally what I wanted to get across, is that Jeff and Brian really were a loving couple. Um, uh, Alice met them at Rutgers on the campus of Rutgers University. Um, actually, in the fall of 77, she continued to work on this into 1978, but they initially met a little bit earlier at the end of the previous year. And uh, Jeff taught at Rutgers, um, and Kelly had met and worked with Jeff later in life, and that's another story. Wonderfully, wonderful story. And um, but they were a committed, loving couple and thought of themselves as married well before gay marriage could ever be imagined to ever happen. And in fact, um, uh, Jeff is inscribed on Brian's tombstone. Um, unfortunately, tragically, Brian uh, would succumb to AIDS on July 4th, 1984, even before Alice Neal herself died later that same year. And um, very poignantly, um, Jeff is inscribed on, on Brian's gravestone as spouse. Um, David Borden and Gregory Badcock, it's that this is the couple that has in one public, Neil publication, they've been described as domestic partners. And believe me, there was nothing domestic about Gregory Badcock. Um, I'll just leave it at that. And, um, but this, they are friends, I suspect maybe with some benefits occasionally. Um, but, um, but beyond that, you know, and I think that, again, that the, the, there's been an impulse to frame these couples, these, two, these dual sitters, as couples in a very particular way. And I wanted to untangle some of that. Thank you. I was just thinking, um, to add briefly, that it, it's almost as if the impulse involves domesticating a relationship that's extremely complex, transgressive, difficult to understand, and imposing heteronormative standards on um, on, on forms of intimacy that are, you know, uh, deeply unconventional. No, thank thank you both. I think the instructions here are to uh, appraise her works through her lens, which is. Uh, being open and empathetic and letting the pictures tell us about who these people are and not imposing our visions of who them. And I'll just make it too that she is telling us, right? I mean, see how entangled Jeff and Brian are. They're, you know, they're just, we're just having breakfast with them, it looks like, right? You're just, we're at the kitchen table with them. And then Brian and, um, or, I'm sorry, David and Gregory aren't even touching, though they seem to be cohabitating in the same space, but not touching, so... Thank you. I think it is now time for our questions. If, if anyone has any questions for our esteemed visitors, I'd be so happy to help our dialogue along. Kelly and Randy, could you please talk to us about Alice Neal's hands? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a great example on the, on the screen right now, both Jeff's hands and um, David's hands. Yeah, the hands are 
Um, always super expressive in Neil's paintings. Sometimes the hands are twisted. They make interesting, curious gestures. Um, I, I I think of the hands as portraits in miniature. <laughs> you know the um, and Neil of course hated the word portrait, but um, you you can tell a lot about um, her sitters from the way she depicts their hands and. I, and and this is just to answer the question in a in, in a different way. Neil always took liberties with reality. At the same time, her sitters are recognizable, and I think that she's able to strike that balance between producing a faithful representation of a sitter without hewing super closely to to what she saw in front of her um, as part of what makes her such a great artist. And it's very true of those hands. The hands are also so colorful. She puts a lot of color into the veins and knuckles and, and flesh of the hands. I'll just say two, um, two things about that. And that question, I mean, thank you for asking that question because I think it's probably on other people's minds here. You may have asked you know, the question that maybe 20 people were, were thinking about. Um, I guess I would just, a couple of things. One is this is where I think her love of El Greco really comes out. If you study El Greco, I mean, of course, El Greco's limbs are all attenuated and expressive and um, you know, mannerist, I guess, to use the, 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 the art historical term. And I think she picks it up a little bit from El Greco, maybe. Um, but also, I think she's also, like so many painters famously, and I say this because I'm a failed painter myself, um, is hands are really hard to paint. And you know, famously, de Kooning hated painting hands. And would uh, artists who hate painting hands will go at great pains to suppress the hand, you know, put them, tuck them away, and just to avoid the difficulty, the technical difficulty of painting a hand. She's really showing she's not afraid of them. You know, this, the, among artists, hands are notoriously difficult to paint, and she's just, this is part of her confidence and her boldness as a painter. Yeah. Well, and in the case of the painting on the left, Jackie has two hands. Um, um, she has, um, he, they have um, a hand that Neil finished and a hand that Neil didn't finish. Uh, and Neil deliberately left evidence of that unfinished hand on the surface of the canvas. And this would become typical of her late unfinished style. And when she was asked about um, that tendency to uh, retain traces of her process, she said, this is what makes my, my paintings modern. Thank, thank you both. Do we, do we have any more questions? Oh, yes. You, you, re you referenced El Greco, and I think there's also some reference from German Expressionism. And I just wonder if you would comment on the, you know, she clearly has looked at other artists, and if you'll talk mm -hmm. about the, the role that influences played on the formation of her own style. Um, Neil looks at El Greco, Neil looks at other artists, German Expressionists. Could you please speak about how these artists impacted her style. We're just getting started, apparently. Um, um, this is a really tough question to answer. Uh, one that also did, like hands, come up a lot uh, with guests in the galleries. And I alluded to it earlier, is she did not give up her sources easily. And it is hard to know what she's looking at. We know that she loved kind of the the classic early modernist, Cezanne, Van Gogh. Van Gogh may not be a huge surprise. Um, not uncommon also for a self-professed modern painter to love Van Gogh. And we, we paired Van Gogh and, uh, and uh, Anil in, on our installation to make that point. Um, but we, Kelly, you have a sort of understanding or a theory about why she was a little bit reluctant to talk about indebtedness to other artists preceding her, right? Yeah, I think it was in part because she was so keen to stake out her own territory to defend her singularity, originality as a, as a woman artist. And I, I think she knew that precisely because she was a woman, her work would be perceived as, deriv as derivative. And so she, she was protective of, of her art historical influences. But she did talk about the artists Randy mentioned, as well as Soutine. She professed um, 
an interest in August Sanders' work, which I think is really interesting. She was definitely looking at Robert Henry, um, and um, but otherwise she was pretty tight-lipped. Mm -hmm. And remember, Kelly, we were both struck how many times guests would, right? That there was a real impulse to attach her to, in many cases, younger male artists. Like, how many times did we hear, um, what, uh, how, how is she looking at, what is she uh, thinking about? Um, was it Bacon? or ba Francis Bacon. Francis it was Bacon. either Francis Bacon or um, Lucian Freud. Yes, Lucian Freud. And... Uh Mm -hmm. We got tired of those questions. I started to get angry, <laughs> and 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 I and I would turn the question around and say, "Well, I think given that she was 10, 20 years older, 20, 22 <laughs> than these, years older, twenty two years older than Freud, than Freud, maybe the question is, what did Freud learn from from her? What did he take from from her? Yeah, no, I would get a little spiky <laughs> a few weeks in. It just week. got a little tired. Yeah. Well, she, she also confessed to admiring Morris Lewis and Clifford Still. And I think mm -hmm. when she does invoke an artist that you might not immediately associate with her, that creates a fun dynamic for thinking about her work. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I love thinking about Clifford Still in the last gallery. Mm -hmm. um, yes? No, no, thank you for uh, setting up that question so well, and I can't repeat all the wonderful things you just said, but um, can we take it away? Um, how, how did she present herself? Was she presenting herself as a male artist, or w was she trying to emulate the way that male artists presented themselves, or was she just presenting herself as an artist? That's... Very good question, uh, tough question to address. I think that, um, again, we, I think we have to continuously remind ourselves the degree to which that she's cutting against so many grains and swimming against so many currents that were you know, obstacles. And she's just damned and determined to do what she wanted to do against all odds, against personal um, uh, adversity uh, uh, due to her gender, um, her, not so much her background, but her, um, you know, family tragedy in the biography is really rough, um, but, and, but she's a model of perseverance. Um, I think that she was, she went to a design school in the 20s, right? It was a design school for women. And she said, actually, often that she went there initially because she didn't want to be distracted by boys. So she went into an all-female environment, but this was a, uh, uh, an experience that was meant to train her to be a decorative lady painter, which I think really set a mark for her, you know, a formative um, a kind of template that she rejected. And there are instances where there are some paintings later that are so like off the rails, frankly, and so abject. And so I think that in certain instances, and they're not necessarily in the show, um, that she, over, she overcompensates for this expectation that if you're going to be an artist, you're going to be painting plates or decoration, um, domestic. And I think that a lot of her public persona kind of flows from those early years and where she really charts her own course. Do you have anything you'd like to add? 
I guess I would, um, I, so in my catalog essay, I tackle her relationship to feminism. And, and I guess we have to think about, um, there are really two questions there. Um, her relationship to the um, aspirations of women, women's liberation and her relationship to a movement. And, and Neil was not a joiner, really. And she, um, you know, she famously said at one point, I was a communist, but I was a bad communist. And the same could be said of feminism. You know, I, she would probably say, I was a feminist, but a bad feminist. She just didn't join. I think she was suspicious of all rules, you know, ideologies, that sort of thing. Um, but then as to the other part of your question, I guess I would, I would, I would ask, what does it mean to act like a male artist and a female artist? What does that what does that mean? I'm not sure, um, because it seems to imply that that women artists can't act tough or cantankerous or irreverent, and and so um, so you know, and Neil was somebody who just acted like herself, I think, and um, yeah. And how many male prima Madonna artists are there out there too? Like, yes, yes, yes. We've all encountered a few. <laughs> I think Ulrich is up there with a question. Complex. No. Human. <laughs> <laughs> and do we, do we have any more questions in the audience? Yes, in the back. Do you want to to, uh, to re repeat the question? Is do, could we view her work as an ob an objection of marginalized people, uh, yeah. or or objectifying Abject them to? Yeah, yeah. I, I I think that's an excellent question, and it's one that Randy and I grappled with in our writing around um, the work, and I and I addressed it briefly in my comments um, on Carmen and and Judy. Um, I think that it can be um, both. I think that um, you know that that sometimes I, I worry about her relationship to her sitters of, of color because there was naturally a um, you know there was a um, hierarchy of power and privilege that that obtained between Neil and and those those folks. Um, at the same time, you know that she cared very deeply about them. We met some of her um, uh, sitters of color, the ones that she painted on the east side of um, Harlem and the, and the west side. And um, uh, we met one sitter, Carmen, who appears in a painting that couldn't travel to New York. And and Carmen and her sister um, uh, lived in the same building as Neil. And Carmen remembers that she was able. Uh, she and her sister were allowed to visit Neil on their own and sit for her by themselves without the presence of a family member. And for her, that indicated that Neil was considered part of the family. Um, she was trusted and respected, probably because she trusted and respected her sitters. So I think um, for, for Randy, we, we try to embrace all the complexity and contradiction of her, of her pictures and her relationships to the people that she painted. You also have, we have Georgie in the middle on the screen right now. Oh, yes. And oh, Georgie, here yeah. you have an example of, there's a sustained engagement 
and it's reflective of a friendship over and, and many years. Many years. He was writing her letters from prison mm -hmm. when he was an adult, and and she continued to care for him. So um, I think in a few ways we tried to suggest throughout the at least especially in the New York section of the exhibition that she was not a voyeur. And, and for the most part, these were members of her community and they were her neighbors and, and younger friends. Yeah, I think that that's really important is that Neil painted people, especially during this period, she painted people close at hand, people who were part of her family, part of her community, whether that was creative, aesthetic, political. Um, and so she's not just painting people, she's painting the relationships she, she has with them. So the, the pictures, many of them bear witness to, to intimacy. Lauren talks about this work in terms of intimacy, which I think is so smart. But you can, you can depict intimacy without sentimentalizing or romanticizing it, which is part of Neil's brilliance. And she was a champion of civil rights and Puerto Rican liberation really her entire life. And um, civil rights was sort of embedded in the communist movement in the early 20th century. And so from the beginning, she was an advocate of, of racial uh, justice. Do we see any more questions in the audience? Well, she actually painted herself more than once, um, and but that is her first, I guess, proper self-portrait. So she painted herself, drew herself into pictures of Jose. Um, there are some in the exhibition. You see her, Hartley in a rocking horse isn't in the show, is it? So she appears um, reflected in the mirror in the background of a picture of one of her sons. But but you're right, she did. And er, those are early pictures. And those are early, and very there, early. There's the agonizing picture of her holding Richard. Is oh, I think Sam is holding oh. Richard. But, but there are also pictures of her as a young mother struggling to corral her young, her young child. But, yeah, but, but, but self-portrait from 1980 is the one, and maybe Randy well, Where she's the sole protagonist of that picture and not in relation, like not, in, um, uh, not in the composition with any, anyone else. Um, well, that is... Well, <laughs> so much to say about the nude self-portrait of 1980. I always call it a manifesto. Yeah. It's a manifesto, um, and it's a, it's a manifesto in so many ways. You talk about uh, those early works, those uh, erotic watercolors being you know, revolutions of her own making, and I think you can draw a line directly from those to this is a... Um, a late career, late life um, manifesto of what she stands for, and she's turning it on herself. Um, and it obviously summarizes what we think of Neil as, um, um, well, I always think of the nudes is that she thinks of clothes as pretense, and she was allergic to pretense. So she, of course, became famous to some extent, or infamous, for asking her sitters right out of the gate if they would take their clothes off. And you know, most, many of them did not, obviously, and that's what happened with Cindy Nimzer and her husband, and they reluctantly finally did it, although Cindy Nimzer re recollected how nervous they were. And um, yeah, can you get to that image? But, but she's then subjecting herself to that experience that she has subjected <laughs> many others by this point to, and it's like facing facts, right? I mean, there's just something about Neil's, the appeal of Neil's work is that she's 
facing facts. And here she's facing facts about her life, her body, her um, mortality, um, her, um, her commitment to art. Uh, she is holding a brush and a rag. Um, keeping in mind that she was left-handed left and she's using a mirror so the brush appears in her right, what appears to be her right hand and not her left. Um, so it's a, it's a manifesto in paint. She knows that other artists have created single works that are meant to be manifestos of their um, uh, principles and ideolo ideologies as artists um, to sum it all up, and I think that's what this does. You also plainly get... Uh uh, evidence of the cumulative physical effects of almost six decades sitting behind behind the canvas. She's showing you where she sits, how she does what she does, and for how long she's been doing it. Okay. Well, um, thank you all for joining us today for this conversation with Kelly and Randy and for being here to enjoy Alice Neal, People Come First. The exhibition is open until July 10th. So please come back again, keep thinking about Neal's work and send us your questions if you have more. We thank hope you. that you enjoy the show as much as we enjoyed putting it together. Yes, and many thanks to Lauren and Tom and Maria and the whole team at the museum for taking such good care of the exhibition and us over the last few days. We've really loved being the here. The installation so. is spectacular. Yeah. Many, many congratulations to Lauren. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you all.